Hi all, so today we're going to be talking about two separate but in some ways interrelated topics within modern approaches to theorizing uh, international political economy. We're going to be talking about feminist approaches within IPE and then we're also going to be talking about how to use IPE to perhaps present uh, or theorize solutions to this monumental challenge that we're facing as a planet right now, which is global climate change. Uh, next class, we're going to be talking about another monumental challenge that we're all facing right now, which is COVID-19 and uh, the relationship between COVID-19 and the global economy and perhaps how we can also use IPE to um, gain some lessons about how uh, we should navigate the global economy moving forward in a pandemic and post-pandemic world. I do uh, have faith that eventually we're going to get to a post-pandemic world. Uh, anyway, without further ado, um, this lecture is probably going to be a little bit shorter because I'm getting the sense that you all are feeling a little burnt out and I totally understand that. Um, it's been a challenging summer for many reasons um, and I again really commend you for tackling this learning adventure during this particularly unique summer in all of our lives. Um, and so I wanna make sure that I'm giving you the space to digest the material that you need. So I, I would prefer this week that you really um, do the readings they are, I think, quite interesting. I think um, I think some of you will find that they cover topics that you've um, brought up previously in class and voiced an interest in. So I, I would really encourage you to do the readings so that we can have a productive discussion on Wednesday. Um, and for that reason, I'm going to keep this relatively short so that you guys have time to read. Okay, so let's start with feminist IPE. Feminist IPE is within the very broad category of theories within um, IPE and IR more generally that we call critical theories. There are many critical theories of IPE and they all adopt similar approaches to other critical IR theories. We've talked about critical theorizing a bit when we were studying constructivism, but let's just do a little recap now. Um, oh, I forgot to hit the slide, I'm sorry. So critical theorizing is different from what we might call mainstream theorizing within international relations because critical theorizing doesn't take the world or the existence of any object or concept as given. Critical theory intentionally and explicitly investigates how the given world order was generated, how certain objects and concepts within international politics came to take on the meanings that they have been ascribed through social interaction, etc. All very constructivist ideas that we've been through before. So, for example, critical approaches to IPE problematize how a given global economic order or structure was created. They ask, how did it come to be? For instance, that trade liberalization um, or the reduction of barriers to trade emerged as the dominant structuring idea for the multilateral tr trade regime post-World War II. Critical theory does not take power relations or institutions as assumed, but questions and problematizes their origins and thus opens up possibilities for changes. Critical theorists tend to uh, seek to shed light on new opportunities for change in the status quo, generally driven by some normatively grounded pers uh, perspective or set of goals. For example, Marxism is in many ways a, a normative approach in that Marxists, based on their interpretation of the international system, believe that class struggle determines outcomes in international politics and that free market cap capitalism is necessarily exploitative of working class citizens at both the domestic and international levels. So basically critical theory criticizes the status quo and attempts to call attention to understudied or underappreciated social forces at work in international politics. And all of that is good and, and necessary. But there is a common critique of critical theory that mainstream theorists tend to retort with. And that is that critical theorists spend too much time critiquing the status quo and dominant theoretical approaches. And meanwhile, they don't really produce theories of their own to replace the mainstream theories that they're critiquing. And this argument, I think, has some validity to it. But critical theorists would argue that questioning the status quo and these dominant theoretical approaches is a crucial first step in dismantling dysfunctional or oppressive political structures and that therefore it's a it's a very worthwhile um, endeavor and, and that fundamentally, char fundamentally characterizes the nature of their work. 
In contrast to mainstream approaches to IPE, critical theorists take a more holistic approach. So critical IPE examines some dimension of human behavior, action, or activity, but then makes an effort to relate it to broader economic and, and social systems. So what does that all mean for doing research and, and thinking about global politics? How would one employ a critical approach to IPE? Critical IPE scholars often analyze one uh, or more of the following three levels of analysis, and that generally forms the starting point for how they conduct their research. So first, some critical uh, IPE scholars look at the development of class identities within various state-society relations. Critical IPE views class identity as emerging within and through particular context and historical processes of economic production and exploitation. So many scholars examine how various classes, for example, create political associations, form institutions or organizations such as labor unions or social movements. Um, and they study how these uh, different institutions promote or inhibit different class demographics from making claims or assertions of autonomy within existing social relations of production. Second, um, some IPE scholars examine capitalist forms of st uh, state power. So, for example, they analyze maybe um, uh, how neoliberalism dominates certain forms of state government and the rise of transnational class interests and that relationship with neoliberalism. Um, or they might analyze how the system of territorial states and territorial sovereignty is being modif uh, modified by processes of globalization and global capitalism. Uh, finally, for a third level of analysis that IPE scholars tend to focus on, uh, is changes in and stability of hegemonic world orders. For example, how can we explain the emergence of the U.S.-based hegemonic world order and tensions within it, which, and also how can we point to ways in which that might be changing uh, in recent years? Uh, or how can we explain this possible demise of the liberal capitalist international world order that's been predicted by some um, particularly Marxist scholars? So these are questions that critical IPE attempts to answer. Now we're going to move on to talk more about the intersections between critical IPE and feminist theory and international relations more broadly. So feminist theorizing within IR seeks to call attention to how gender dynamics influence international politics in ways that are not appreciated by the dominant or mainstream approaches to IR theorizing. For example, a feminist IR scholar might study how the fact that most state leaders are men influences the propensity for interstate conflict. Uh, or maybe they would study the conditions under which women can gain the skill sets and social status necessary to lead transnational advocacy movements and the implications that that has for the success of those movements. Uh, or perhaps they would study the role of non-combatant women in providing crucial support networks for war fighting. There is no singular feminist IR theory or approach. Rather, there are a variety of feminist approaches and many intersect with several other theoretical approaches. For example, there are liberal feminists, Marxist feminists, constructive feminists, etc. Feminists often share theoretical assumptions with these um, broader grounding theories. For example, many feminists agree with the realist assumption that conflict is inevitable, but they think that conflict is inevitable for very different reasons than, than realists do. So feminism has been well established within um, many disciplines within the humanities and other disciplines within social science for, uh, for centuries, really. But it's rather a, a late comer to mainstream IR. Um, female IR scholars were coming of age during the, the late 1980s and 1990s, which led to an increase in uh, academic panels employing feminist theory at political science conferences um, and a surge in more gendered approaches to questions and issues within IR. Feminist IR problematizes the role of the state, much like other critical theories. And instead of conceiving the state as the central actor in the system, feminist IR views the state as a quote, set of patriarchal practices that support, yet silence, the structural disadvantages that women face. In other words, the central claim of feminism is that gender matters, and it is a central, if not the primary unit of analysis 
with uh, feminists typically viewing gender as socially constructed, uh, uh, excuse me, they typically view gender as a socially constructed differentiation of masculine and feminine. So again, we're talking about gender. We're not talking about um, sex ascribed at birth. Feminist hour theorists very much operate within um, this idea that gender is a socially constructed concept and that we can differentiate masculine from feminine social concepts. The variety of approaches that fall under this wide umbrella of feminism share a few central assumptions. First, international politics is characterized by patriarchy and masculinity is privileged with power in the international system. The same is true for IR scholarship. Key concepts in the traditional study of IR privilege the masculine. Women and their experiences for a very long time were rendered invisible by traditional, uh, by this traditional focus of um, dominant approaches within IR on public events, figures, and politics as uh, understood as competition for power. So feminist IR is interesting um, in that, like all other critical approaches, it not only um, critiques the status quo of the international system, but it critiques the status quo of how we as IR scholars study the international system. Uh, a second assumption that's shared by uh, feminist theorists are that issues in international politics are ranked in gendered fashion. This is because until at least recently, actually no, this is still true, what am I saying? Most actors in the international system are men. When we look at conflict, politics, and economics, decisions are based on the experiences of men and, and made by men. So issues that are traditionally championed by women, uh, what are sometimes called the, quote, low politics issues of health care, education, child care, um, and perhaps even the environment, have been deemed irrelevant, particularly by realists, throughout the majority of the history of IR as an academic discipline. Feminists argue that the theory and practice of IR have overemphasized uh, what we call high politics concepts, such as anarchy, security, sovereignty, power, etc., at the expense of understanding the fundamental role of the patriarchy for ordering international political interaction. The goal of feminist IR is not simply to add women to the story of international politics, but rather to uncover and expose the field of IR as one that is and uh, will always will be in some ways gendered and reproduces a gendered view of the international system. Feminist IR scholars also argue that the nature of IR is essentially conflictual and has a masculine bias that ignores women. More recent feminist scholarship has focused on the intersectionality of gender with other demographic factors such as race, sexuality, and economic class to try to uncover and explain the multiple layers of oppression that render certain actors relatively powerless in the international system while other actors reap exponential magnitudes of power based on their demographics. So although feminist IR overlaps in many ways with critical approaches, most critical IPE scholars rarely incorporate gender into their analyses. Critical IPE um, has continued to focus primarily on class as the main axis of economic power differentiation and inequality, while other axes such as gender and race are still largely ignored. And feminists within IPE are seeking to correct this. But again, merely adding women into critical IPE approaches is too limited because it fails to see gender as fundamentally constitutive of certain economic processes. Critical IPE lacks acknowledgement that gender is a constitutive force in processes and consequences of globalization. So on what would a feminist or gendered analysis of globalization focus? Well, it would go beyond narrow materialist understandings of critical IPE and address ideational and cultural factors as well. Some new work uh, within feminist IPE examines, for example, the gender biases of economic institutions at various levels. Some studies investigate the ways in which women's labor has been central to export production, both in the industrial and agricultural sectors. Other studies examine the ways in which changes in the organization of global financial structures and the impact of the financial instability that has resulted from the deregulation of capital markets um, 
impacts men and women in different ways. Other studies also, um, uh, just another example, they, they look at the relationship between, uh, let's say, trade liberalization and, and women's employment in both the developing and developed worlds. One major theoretical contribution to feminist IPE is the vital role of women in social reproduction that supports the global economic status quo. You read about that in Meg Luxton's article for, that I assigned for today. And we'll go over now what, just briefly, what social reproduction means and why feminists argue that the concept must be integrated into mainstream IPE studies. So Luxton defines social reproduction as labor that is outside the purview of formal, formal capital production, but essential for the continuation of human life on a daily and generational basis. That slide is supposed to say generational, not general. Excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, in other words, social reproduction are the activities involved in the production of life. For example, having babies, raising and educating children, caregiving for the elderly or vulnerable, maintaining sanitary living conditions, and preparing and distributing food within the home. Feminists call attention to the fact that historically and throughout the world today, these duties are predominantly carried out by women. Feminists do not claim that men never do these activities or that the other types of labor that men tend to do are unimportant. Rather, feminists argue that the typically unpaid and underpaid labor involved in social reproduction is as essential to the global economy as material and capital production, and that IPE lacks uh, explanations for many global economic phenomenon due to the uh, scholars within that approach's lack of attention to women's roles in social reproduction and their disproportionate focus on historically masculinized labor. Scholars of the global economy emphasize the production of goods for markets, ignoring or taking for granted the production of people. Feminist IPE approaches take a normative stance in that they claim that social reproduction and fostering human well-being should be the driving force of, of economics, rather than production for markets and, and private profits. As Luxton says, political economy must be reworked to recognize the centrality of social production. Feminist analyses of social reproduction have three central goals, according to Luxton. One, identifying the sites where social reproduction takes place and examining who does the work and its implications for social relationships. So in doing so, feminists ask what structures, institutions, and social relations have to be produced in order to ensure continuity with the status quo. Second, feminist analyses develop critiques of political economy to reveal its limited and androcentric assumptions. Androcentric simply means um, focused on men or masculinity. So for example, feminist IPE critiques mainstream IPE for failing to take into account gender and race divisions and systems of labor, and for excluding the domestic activities that women perform from their conceptualization of the global economy. Third, feminist analyses reconstruct politics and theory to put social reproduction at the center, with explicit commitments to theorizing the relationships among gender, race, and class. One example of how feminists have tried to do this in practice is by lobbying efforts to revise the national system of accounts to include unpaid labor work um, in its evaluations of countries' GDP. The national system of accounts is an internationally agreed standard um, or set of standards of uh, recommendations on how to compile measures of economic activity. So GDP is um, a pivotal measure of economic activity, obviously. And um, there, were, there was an effort by many academics, actually, and transnational advocates to get the national system of accounts to revise its definition of how to calculate GDP to take into account um, unpaid labor within the domestic sphere. Uh, this, effort ultimately failed, but it is an example of um, how feminists are trying to apply their work in practice. A central argument of feminists within IPE is that social reproduction is essential to the process of capital accumulation. And as outlined in the Luxton reading, several feminists working within IPE provide compelling evidence to support this claim. Um, for one, the majority of foreign immigrants and migrants working as caretakers in industrialized societies are women. 
This allows both women and men with children and disabled or elderly dependents to go to work and contribute to capital production in that industrialized country because they can hire female migrant labor to cover the home front. On that other side of the equation, the children that those female migrants leave behind in their poorer home countries often lose many of the benefits of growing up with their parent in their household. Uh, some more evidence is that women's household labor is theorized uh, by Luxton herself. She sort of quotes her, quotes her own work in this piece. Um, women's household labor is threatened to pick up the slack, so to speak, for reduced state spending, labor market insecurity, and weakened legal protections for workers and the poor. So for example, when the state reduces spending on early childhood education, mothers are typically the ones who have to find alternative means to educate their young children, sacrificing their own time and often their earning potential to do so. Uh, finally, women's household labor can be considered residual subsistence labor, expanding or contracting as much as possible to offset the impact of market forces, state practices, or changing family circumstances. And I, I, I really think that in no point in recent history has this been made more clear than during the COVID-19 pandemic that we're currently living in. Many parents, uh, and perhaps you are one of those parents or you know those parents, um, are now both working from home and taking primary responsibility for educating their children at home during their work day. So the number of hours in the day didn't change, but many parents, particularly women and particularly single parents of all genders, are now finding themselves tasked with two or more full-time jobs that they have to perform simultaneously. So they've stretched out to meet the demands of the current situation, and they're not being compensated or really assisted in, in any way by the government, um, particularly here in the US. So as you may have noticed, um, thus far I've been primarily talking about pretty micro-level analyses of women's participation in the global economy. And there's a reason for that. Feminist IPE has disproportionately analyzed groups and individuals who constitute gendered actors outside of formal institutions. And Georgina's, uh, Georgina Whalen's article that I assigned for next class critiques this trend in feminist IPE. Whalen claims that feminist IPE has been very good at analyzing what she calls the governance of gender, but the approach has been less successful with producing knowledge about the gender of governance. In other words, while feminist IPE has extensively studied the ways in which women have been shut out from creating economic policy um, and the differentials in how men and women are impacted by certain policies, feminist IPE has had much less to say about how institutions of global governance, for example, the UN, the World Bank, and the IMF, operate as gendered institutions and the roles of different actors within those institutions. There are some scholars who have tried to expand feminist IPE's explanatory power to global governance by crafting an institutionalist theory of feminist IPE, but this is a pretty recent turn in the literature and it's still underdeveloped. So Whelan is trying to contribute to that development here in this article that I assigned, and she's trying to stretch, uh, sketch out a framework for further developing feminist institutionalism to interrogate how varying gender differentials within major international institutions, as well as more informal regimes, impact the characteristics and underlying objectives of global economic policymaking. For example, such an approach could help us answer questions like, does it matter if a woman is at the head of the IMF? Would the IMF operate any differently if that was the case? Um, would a higher representation of women of color working at the World Bank impact the type of infrastructural projects that the World Bank invests in in the developing world? Or uh, even questions like, what factors empower women's rights campaigns to achieve success at the UN level? These are all really important questions, and questions of this type have traditionally been neglected in IR, and even within feminism, because we don't have a uh, really well-developed institutionalist theory of feminism. So this, this new trend towards feminist institutionalism might provide a path forward to correct that. That's something that I would uh, love to hear your thoughts about during the discussion session on Wednesday. Okay, so now we're basically going to shift gears entirely and talk about climate change in the uh, context of IP. I had to cover both of these topics and um, I admit that they don't fit super well together in one lecture, so I'm going to ask you to sort of put feminism away in your brain for a minute and um, move on with me here. 
Uh, but of course, climate change and feminism do have um, certain intersections. Uh, we all know that the negative impacts of climate change are felt most acutely by poorer populations in the developing world. And women in those uh, areas tend to be poorer than men. So do be thinking about um, some of the potential connections between these two separate sets of readings as we will be engaging with that during the discussion session. Uh, so your paper that is due on Wednesday is centered around the Paris Climate Agreement. And as you know, the central goal put forth by this agreement is restricting global temperature rise to two degrees Celsius in the 21st century with what the agreement calls an aspirational goal to actually keep that temperature rise be below 1.5 degrees Celsius. So they basically given themselves a range that they're gonna consider to be success. They would really like to keep it below 1.5 degrees Celsius, but I guess we'll settle with two. I don't know how those numbers are calculated. I'm not a scientist. Um, so the, the Honegger and Reiner reading assigned for today provides what I think is a really interesting concrete view on how that might actually be able to be achieved through cooper uh, international cooperation. The authors of this piece are environmental scientists. They're not political scientists, so they actually know what they're talking about when it comes to the nitty-gritty technological expertise that is necessary to inform the strategies that countries should use to mitigate global temperature rise. It also gives you guys something different to read. It's an entirely different style of writing and, and format of writing than we generally see in poli-sci. So um, yeah, read the article, it's really cool. Anyway, so it it's really cool, but it's also pretty complicated. And I had to read it a couple times to like figure out what they were saying, because again, I'm not a scientist. Um, I'm not a real scientist. <laughs> Political scientists aren't real scientists, y'all. I don't know if anyone ever told you that. Um, so I, I do just want to lay out the framework of their argument so that we can all get on the same page. Um, and then maybe after you watch this lecture, if you, I mean, if you understood it the first time, great, then you're smarter than me. Um, but then after you watch this lecture, if you, if you weren't quite clear as to what Honegger and Reiner were saying, I hope it'll be more helpful for you to then go back through um, and hopefully pick, pick up more of it the second time. Anyway, so um, Honegger and Reiner put forth this really novel approach to using negative emissions technologies, which are called nets, to basically save the planet. Uh, but they acknowledge that the success of their proposed um, plan fundamentally hinges on international oversight to prevent negative externalities that could be potentially incurred through counterproductive use of nets that could harm um, sustainable development as well as potentially provoke political unrest. Uh, the success of their approach also hinges on international commitment to a market mechanism where countries can basically buy and sell what they call uh, emissions mitigation units to incentivize the use of negative emissions technologies. So really quickly here, so we can understand what they're proposing, um, I'm going to go through some of just very brief background of the features of the Paris Agreement that the authors uh, reference within this paper. So the Paris Agreement requires all state parties to create and implement what are called nationally determined contributions, or NDCs, which are plans for reducing greenhouse gas emissions based on national capacity and current emissions levels for every state. So the Paris Agreement is actually not a particularly formalized treaty and that there are no specific policies that the agreement actually tries to force all states to implement. Um, state parties were given wide discretion to write their own NDCs, which they have to make public and submit to the UN, but then the states themselves are basically in charge of enforcing those plans on their own and policing their own adherence to the NDCs that they themselves wrote. So contrary to some of Trump's rhetoric, um, I'm sure if you guys have started writing the paper, which I hope you have by now, I guess it's Monday. Um, I'm sure you all know that we have pulled out, uh, the United States has pulled out of the Paris Agreement. Um, and that there was a lot of lead up to that where Trump was extensively criticized in the agreement. And contrary to some of his rhetoric during that time, uh, the Paris Agreement does not entail the United Nations forcing the US to cut jobs in the coal sector or implement any specific UN mandated policies. The only specific action that the US and all other countries had to comply with under the Paris Agreement was reporting their annual greenhouse gas emissions to the UN. 
But the U.S., like every other party to the agreement, got to write its own plan for reducing emissions and was ultimately free to decide what domestic policies it would implement to achieve the goals laid out in that plan. Still, even though the Paris Agreement allowed states to have a very wide um, level of discretion in terms of policy implementation, uh, Trump pulled out of it, so that's a strike against the theory that more flexible international agreements are easier to get states to comply with. Anyway, there's this really cool article in the Paris Agreement. Uh, it's Article 6.4, and it's called the Sustainable Development Mechanism. This mechanism is designed to, fil to facilitate international cooperation for greenhouse gas emissions reduction and sustainable development promotion. Basically, the mechanism allows states to craft bilateral agreements where one state, let's call it state A, agrees to help another state, let's call it state B, reduce its emissions levels. These activities can then count towards state A's fulfillment of its NDC. So it acts as an incentive for states to cooperate to help each other reduce their respective emissions because they can basically get credit for that that goes towards reaching their own NDC goals. This sustainable development mechanism, Article 6.4, is crucial for Honegger and Rayner's proposal. To just very briefly summarize their quite complex argument, um, the authors propose that states potentially with the help of the World Bank, can invest in negative emissions technologies or nets. The type of net that the authors are primarily referring to are, are what are called BECs, which stands for Bioenergy with Carbon Capture and Storage. BECs are processes for extracting bioenergy from plant or animal material used for energy production and capturing and storing the carbon in that material which consequently removes the carbon from the atmosphere. Some of that carbon can then be converted into usable energy by combustion processes, and the rest can be stored in underground geological formations. And this is called geological sequestration. There are risks to geological sequestration, which is why the authors call for, international, for an international enforcement body to regulate where carbon can be stored in order to, um, for example, prevent the exploitation of indigenous land. So the problem here is that BECs and NETS more generally are very expensive processes. The technology has not yet advanced far enough to make energy production from NETS competitively profitable. The solution proposed by Honegger and Reiner is to use the sustainable development mechanism in the Paris Agreement, that Article 6.4, to create an international market for, net, for nets. So the idea is that less wealthy states that are still moderate to high emitters, potentially with the help of investment from the World Bank, can acquire the capacity to utilize BECs. Then wealthier countries can set up agreements under the sustainable development mechanism to buy what the authors call emissions mitigation units from countries with BECs. Effectively, what that means is that the rich country pays the poorer country to offset the poorer country's carbon emissions through BECs, and then the rich country gets to count that offset unit towards its own NDC fulfillment goals. Now, the authors argue that there are a lot of potential critiques of this proposal and um, uh, the ways in which it could go wrong if states don't really commit to it. So I want you to read through this article before Wednesday so that we can think about uh, what you think about Honegger and Rainer's proposal during the discussion session. And we're also going to talk about the Kuzemko et al. reading during the discussion session as well. So next steps. Um, on Monday, so a week from today, uh, we're going to do our session on IPE and COVID-19. Because this is obviously such a rapidly changing topic, um, I still have not finalized the like reading assignments for you yet. And I might actually have you um, do some like either podcast watching or like there's a couple cool YouTube videos that I've found. So basically I am promising you that by Wednesday, 
I will get you what you need to read or watch for that class. I've already picked out two blog posts that I want you to read by um, Kevin, Rudd, Kevin Rudd excuse me, and Jason Douglas. Um, I believe that they're on the Canvas module, and if they're not on the Canvas module yet, they will be linked in the syllabus. There should be links to them in the syllabus. Um, either way, you'll, find, you'll be able to find them somewhere, and if you can't find them, just email me. Um, so that is going to be a super interesting class. I think I'm tired of talking about COVID-19, so I'm in some ways like regretting doing this. <laughs> I'm like, why did I put this on the syllabus? Um, but I, it's fine. Um, it's going to be really interesting, and um, nothing has changed the global economy like this before, like maybe in the history of the world. So it's something that we definitely need to talk about, despite the fact that I'm tired of talking about the pandemic. Okay, um, as always, let me know if you need any assistance with your papers. Uh, I'm happy to, to look stuff over before you turn it in. And I think that's all I have for you today. So uh, have a great evening, and we will see you Monday. Wednesday, excuse me, Wednesday. See you Wednesday.